Good day to you. I'm pretty sure we've all had the experience of having gone to watch a film that we saw previews for, trailers even, on the web, and we were really excited about the film because of those trailers. But by the time we got to see the film and it was all done, it seems that the best parts of the film were actually what was represented in just those few seconds of the trailers. In other words, the trailers did not represent the film that well. The opposite has probably happened too. I had an experience the other night. I went to watch a James Carey film, a Jim Carey film, and it was called Yes Man. And I thought it was kind of eh, iffy based on the trailers, but it turned out to me to be very funny, at least for my sense of humor. And so the opposite was true in a different direction. And that's my entry point for today. It's the idea of do the outcomes of what we are expecting match the truth of what we are led to believe by the media presentation? Do the outcomes match the truth? In essence, that is what pragmatism is all about. Pragmatism, taking on now chapter four, really our third theoretical perspective, our third theoretical framework, continuing on in this class, doing the intellectual work that's necessary to become media critics. That's what you're doing, right? This is a class on media criticism. You're training yourself. And already your mind is developed, having been through Marxism and organizational analysis. You're starting now just not just to study individual perspectives, but you're starting now to think from a higher level, a higher level of connecting perspectives together in and of themselves. And actually, by the end of this course, you're going to be comparing two perspectives when you get to your final paper. So it's only fitting that your mind is developing now. And it's also fitting that this chapter is now starting to introduce intellectual heavyweights into the perspectives as we study them for the rest of this course. And so I am expecting you to up your game now. We are going to be recognizing the major authors who have contributed to our perspectives as we go forward. We've, gone, we've, got, we've been through Marxism, which had some of that, organizational analysis, not so much, but for the rest of the class, you'll see that academia is informing much of the perspectives that, we're, that we'll be studying. And this one is, is certainly one that's, that's the case for, and that's pragmatism, which is associated with the founder, Charles Pierce, founded with the ch founder, Charles Pierce, but as you will read on in the chapter, there are many others who have contributed to pragmatism. It, Charles Pierce was a philosopher, and he was, a, he was interested in branching out from his method of philosophy to assess truth in terms of outcomes, not just to talk about pie in the sky, as he might have said it, ideals, as Plato discussed them before, about a strong ruler, for example. Forget all that. It can't just exist in theory. You have to actually have outcomes to see if the truth has occurred. And that's what Charles Pierce was trying to do. And, and so he's saying, abandon the search for underlying truths that you can only hypothesize and meditate about and reach through religion. Instead, we need to look at the degree to which the outcomes are matching what we are seeking in terms of truth. And so that's the basis that we begin pragmatism on. It sounds like practicalism. And it is true that those words are related, but it's there is a difference. Pragmatism is a philosophical framework, and it's measuring outcomes based on whether those outcomes are matching up with the truth of what has been promised. Whereas being practical is just saying, you know, I have to do what works. And pragmatism can be working, so pragmatism can be practical, but they are not one and of the same. Let's move on to some other great contributors to this perspective. William James being one of them. William James, a great American thinker. Most of these thinkers are American. In fact, pragmatism is almost uniquely an American ideal, an American theoretical framework for analyzing media. William James was a psychologist. He's not a communication person. He's a psychologist, and he wrote a book called Pragmatism, and he talked about having a habit in this book, ha a habit, which is a pathway of, discharged, of discharge that's formed in the brain by which incoming events escape. So it's a pathway of discharge formed in the brain by which incoming events escape. So what's left is the pragmatic side of your existence, the stuff that gets pushed out and unfiltered. If you're watching TV, for example, and your cell phone rings, which one do you push out? as a media consumer? Do you push out the cell phone by hitting decline or turning the volume rocker down? Or do you push mute on the TV? Which one do you push out so that you can focus on the other? It's all part of the habits. 
that William James was getting at. He was speaking about everyday habits, not about media habits. He was writing, after all, in 1842 up through 1910. That's when William James is writing. But he, his ideas can be applied to media as well. And he says that habits can be good. They can be good, like exercising in response to stress. That's a good habit. But habits can be very bad, too, like eating a ton of ice cream when you're under stress. So, William James, you, you can think about our habits when we apply it to our media use. Are you on your phone, for example, when you should be studying or you should be attending to relationships or you should be sleeping? Is that something that is a bad habit? Or are you on your phone when you're traveling to Costa Rica because your parents wanna make sure that you're okay and you're making sure you're letting them know you're okay? That's a good habit. William James in terms of media criticism. Now let's go on to another major American thinker. You study these people, if you study the field of education, by the way, and also the field as my undergraduate was in for was in is the field of history. You study these same thinkers. John Dewey. John Dewey is the next one. He was a, an educational theorist. He came up through the through the field of education and, and, and teachers, but he became a theory, a theorist about education. And, and he wrote Reconstruction in Philosophy. That was his major work, Reconstruction in Philosophy. And he said that ways of thinking are habits that people generate to overcome difficulties. So we have difficulties in our life, so we generate habits to overcome those difficulties. The difficulty of getting to work without having any information is overcome by turning on the radio. Even if you're listening to a rock station or hip hop station or country station, you're still gonna get some information there via the radio program that you're listening to as a way to overcome the difficulty of, of not having any information while you're getting ready for the day and being left out of, of things that might be going on. And so you can read more about John Dewey. I'm gonna to start to move through these a little bit quicker as you are now cultivating that ability to dig deep in the chapter and to answer the chapter summaries with enough detail, as well as the question responses, which require original thinking, but you've gotta have that foundational knowledge that you've gotten from the chapter. So make sure that you read about meliorism when you read about John Dewey. Meliorism, that's a term that's gonna come in very handy when you're criticizing media. Moving on now, we have another philosopher, Richard Rorty. Richard Rorty piggybacking on top of John Dewey, piggybacking on top of William James, all continuing a body of thought, right? Isn't it interesting to be part of a movement if you consider yourself to be a pragmatist that you want to write something to contribute to that? That's what academics do, right? And it's a larger way of seeing the world. Hope we like to think it is. Richard Rorty writing from 1931 all the way up to 2007, so really in our current time period, even though he's not living anymore, not too long ago, he was an analytic philosopher. So another philosopher here, and his work aligns with the empiricism that comes out of the hard sciences. If you know what that I mean by that, in the hard sciences, you know, biology, chemistry, physics, they use empirical methods to discover knowledge. They do the scientific testing, right? They do experimental groups and they do control groups. And that's the scientific method, right? To the very one population, but keep another one the same and then compare them and see if, if there's a cause and effect there. That's how you discover whether vaccines, for example, can be used to cure a coronavirus. And so this kind of thinking, um, analytic philosophy, is applied to pragmatism as an interesting way of looking at the world. And he does that through two terms that you should become acquainted with. One is ironism, which is the basis of irony. So ironism, which we normally think of as coming out of the English language, when you have irony, it's something is ironic. It's, it's kind of commenting on itself that it shouldn't be, even though it is itself. That's irony. And so you've got ironism is a is an important term of Richard Rorty, as well as relativism. Relativism, those are two terms that you should dig into. Now let's go on to the idea of a pragmatic approach to government and the regulation of media, because media are regulated. It does impact the regulation, how media content content ends up forming. For example, in the United States, as you will, as we may be able to discover in Costa Rica, it's just flat out illegal to use obscenity. In, in either radio or television. If you use the word fuck in, in a radio broadcast, you're liable for a fine. You're allowed one miss. It's called the fleeting expletive rule. Yeah, there actually is a regulation called the fleeting expletive regulation where you're allowed one slip up like that if you correct it and, and bail out of the song. But if you let it play repeatedly, that's you're in trouble. So we have explicit laws, very, very 
codified laws about obscenity in this country, and that's what the pragmatic approach tries to take a look at. It looks at the consequences, it looks at the contingencies, and it looks at regular contingencies. Those are three terms that you should take a look at. Contingencies are, are things that, that may happen that need attention. That's what contingencies are. If you have a contingency plan, for example, in your household, it's a, in case of a flood, in case of a power outage. That's this things that may change and you have to be prepared for. So government regulation is in many ways anticipating what you have to be prepared for if the media has too much power in terms of swaying political opinion, um, has too much power in terms of making money at people's human decency expense. Uh, has too much power in terms of driving up the costs of advertising. There's a lot of different powers that the government has to be wary of media having, and that's where a pragmatic approach to studying media regulation, in other words, how media are controlled by the government, or at least influenced, that's why a pragmatic approach to studying that is very, very important. Now let's move on to some overall issues, and this is where I will get a little bit detailed. Overall issues in the regulation of American media the pragmatic analysis allows us to take a look at these issues because we are looking at outcomes, right, to see if the truth has been met. So the first idea is a monopoly. It's a term that we approached actually during our last class in organizational communicate. And when we did the organizational analysis, I kind of made a joke about a monopoly. When you get in an airport, it's a monopoly, right? You can't, you can't get something that's cheap in an airport. They know they have you captive. Literally, they have you captive. You've been through security. Can't go back out. And all of the stores in there are, it, well, maybe not all of them, but they are certainly um, tied together through financial interests with the airport. The airport is leasing out space to those stores. And in many cases, the stores have the same ownership group. And in some cases, there are stores that are franchises. You have one in one terminal, like a Ruby Tuesday, and another the same Ruby Tuesday franchise store in another terminal. So you have a lot of monopolization there where one company is controlling things. And, and yet, what has been promised within the pragmatic model in terms of your media, you're promised all kinds of choices, right? If you have cable or satellite television, I don't know how you get your television, or let's just say you only have streaming television, what have you been promised? Turns out that, that Showtime has a monopoly over Shameless. So if you are subscribing to Netflix, you're not gonna get Shameless unless it's really, really old seasons. So there is a monopoly there that goes with subscribing to one particular online channel. Are you being delivered? Are the outcomes of your subscribing meeting the truth that's been promised to you that you have a lot of variety? That's what pragmatism takes a look at. Next up is the idea of protecting intellectual property. Protecting intellectual property. Many of you already are performing on the web. You're recording YouTube videos. You're recording music. You're doing graphics. You're doing things like that because many of you are communication majors, but also because it's just natural for people in your generation to be using technology to express yourselves. And so to what degree do you feel that you have the right to control that? And to what degree do you feel that you have a right to be upset if somebody tries to take your likeness, especially if they're making money off it, right? Especially if you end up in a catalog or you end up on a web page without your, you even knowing it and then you're being used as part of the branding effort of a company. That's another area of pragmatism that we take a look at is copyright laws, protecting copyright laws. And is what's being promised being delivered? Are we seeing the outcomes that we expect to see in terms of our copyright law? We have copyright laws in this country that are designed to protect artist royalties. So if you are Celine Dion, who's going around now, or if you're Taylor Swift, or if you're Shania Twain, or if you're anybody out there, Lucas Graham, you, you have copyright protection by virtue of music license companies. Music license companies will collect money from radio stations in order for the privilege to play your music. And those music license companies then provide you with payments in terms of royalties depending on how often your song is played. That's designed to protect the music of the musician. It's designed to say to the musician, hey, your work matters. Nobody else can just come and use it and make money off it, less of all a radio station that's selling advertising time. So if your song is going to be played for, the, for a money-making benefit, you deserve royalties. But is that really the outcome through our media regulation? Because our media regulation in this country allows a person to make one personal copy of a song, whether you get it from downloaded source like a cloud or a 
streaming service like Spotify or old school, somebody gives you a CD or it's on a flash drive or you copy it as a file off of a phone or MP3 file sent through email, you get one download. So is that really protecting the artist's copyrights? Is it really or does it just make it too open so that people will share that music for free, including making money? If you're having a party and you have a cover charge and you're playing music, you're using that music to drive people into the party. You're using that music to help make money. Is the artist really benefiting the way that our law is structured? Yet another area is maintaining national interest. Maintaining national interest. We hear a lot about the United States' national interest when it comes to foreign policy. All countries have foreign policy. You know, Costa Rica doesn't even have an army. They disbanded their army as part of their peace-loving efforts. Costa Rica is sort of like the Sweden of Central America, disbanded its army right after World War II. So, so isn't that interesting? That what's going, What are we going to see when we get down there in terms of media used to promote the national interest of Costa Rica? Probably not going to see much militaristic national interest there. We're going to probably see more having to do with the environment, the ecosystem. That's a guess. Yet another area that pragmatism says that we should take a look at is promoting diversity. In actual fact, the percentage of managers and owners and stockholders in media in the United States when it comes to diversity is very, very poor as a track record. Ethnicities, in one way to do, to define diversity, it's not the only way, but the, one of the main ways to, through ethnicities, African Americans and Latinos, very, very poor, the record that we have in terms of Afri African Americans and Latinos, Latinas being owners being stockholders, being board holders. We have some isolated companies. We have Telemundo, Univision, Latin America. We have the BET network founded by an African-American, Robert Johnson. But those people are few and far between. So what is going on with our policy is, are there structural barriers there that are not allowing the outcomes that we've been promised? All these laws that we're passing, affirmative action, equal opportunity, it's not yet resulting in at the top management being diversified. So we would say that pragmatism is able to reveal that. And then there's the idea of managing morality. Managing morality, the, the media are expected not to corrupt the youth across all countries, right? That differs depending on the country. For example, in Sweden, you're not allowed to use a child in an advertisement, period. You can't get life insurance or car insurance like the E-Trade commercials, if you remember those from the U.S., illegal. And you can't target ads at kids either, period. They're not old enough. They haven't matured enough. They're too vulnerable. It's the way Sweden looks at things. And, and we have laws not quite that strict in this country. We have laws protecting children. We can't have ads for toys right next to a cartoon, for example. That's about managing morality. We manage morality. The regulations manage morality, not just in the obscenity area, not just in the commercial area with children, but also managing morality in, in other areas as well. Some There are groups in our country that are against uh, glorifying cosmetic surgery on cable channels. The Parents Television Association in our country wants to curtail uh, any programs that make cosmetic surgery look like it's natural because of the harm that it does to a person's psychology and because of the unnecessity of it is what the group argues. All right, so that finally takes us to the last item that we want to get across today, that a pragmatism philosophy, a pragmatism framework, a pragmatism theory can, can help us reveal when we study media, and that is violence. That is violence, and we're going to take a look at effects here to see what, what we can say might be happening with media content that is violent, whether it's in the news, which would be very, very realistic violence if it's actually a news report of somebody being shot, killed, somebody being uh, hurt in a war, that's I mean, somebody being hurt in an accident, that's real life, right? But then there's also violence that we see on fictional shows like CSI, for example. We have fictional violence, people shooting guns all the time, some people getting going through miraculous recoveries after being shot up. That, that happens all the time in our American fictional television and streaming programming. And then we also have violence that occurs in terms of reality programming. It's a you know, domestic violence is it's captured on reality television. So we have a lot of a violence. So what is what do we say happens? Well, one effect is called the aggressor effect. The pragmatic approach helps us to reveal that the aggressor effect, which is that violence will trigger arousal. It'll trigger arousal. And so the people that become accustomed to violence in media through video gaming as well, that that's going to be a kind of a turn on for them and that they're going to be more inclined to, to commit violence. That's the effects that pragmatism looks at, or one of the effects that pragmatism looks at in that area. And there's also an effect that's called a victim effect. A victim effect where people experience 
a heightened effect or feeling that they are victimized by virtue of watching media. There's some studies that are, have been done by George Gerbner, a famous professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and his studies were in the area of cultivation analysis, just a sidebar here because it kind of fits in. And his studies proved that people who watched a lot of local television news in big cities, like Philadelphia News, New York News, they were more afraid of their environment. They saw it as more dangerous. And that's what this is speaking to the victim of that people feel victimized by their use of media. Then there's a bystander effect, a bystander effect, which is the idea that we become more indifferent to others suffering because of what we're seeing on the media. You know, how many times have you walked past a homeless person and not wondered, you know, are they able to walk at all? They're laying down there on the sidewalk, it's freezing. How many times have you walked past people that sounded like they were getting in a shouting match and you just continued on your way? Have you walked by a person who just is standing there and they look like they're in trouble, just keep on walking by? That's what, that's what this a pragmatic effect is looking at is do we become desensitized through seeing content, a lot of violent content where we just, we, we don't, we're, not, we're unaffected by human beings undergoing real suffering. Then there's the catharsis effect, the catharsis effect, which is the idea that watching video games is actually reducing violence in our real lives because it's letting us purge all these pent up anger feelings that we have and, and pent up energy and, and pent up frustration and, and that we get it out. We get it out by video games. You get it out by watching a movie where a lot of people are shot up and killed. We get it out by listening to a song that's really, really violent. Somebody's really letting it out. And then it's okay. It's catharsis, emotional, out, emotional cleansing, if you think of it that way. So there you have it, plenty of ideas that are going to wrap up our final chapter and our final ethical, our final theoretical perspective, pragmatism, as we head next into the meat of the course taking place in Costa Rica. Bon voyage.